Faith Dimensions invites you to understand more fully the subject of righteousness by faith. This is a series of 20 Christ-centered messages from the dynamic new book and study guide entitled 95 Theses by Morris Vinden. Now, with today's message on law, here is Pastor Morris Vinden. Today we're going to talk about law and grace. That's a hard one because, again, some people think you can't be friendly to the law if you believe in the grace of God. And others feel you can't be friendly to the grace of God if you're friendly to law. But the two according to the Bible, go so well together that we cannot separate them. The Apostle Paul, of course, had a great deal to say on this, that we are not saved by the law, that we're saved by grace and not by the works of the law. But the Apostle Paul and the rest of the Bible use the term law in more ways than one. Let's just notice some of these ways in which law is used because if we don't make a difference between them then we can get confused making them overlap and uh, causing us to misunderstand. For instance, according to Romans the third chapter verse 20, the law is for the purpose of telling us what sin is. By the law is the knowledge of sin. The Apostle James uh, has another way of approaching this. He likens the law to a mirror in the first chapter of James, where uh, you look into the mirror and you see that your face is dirty. And uh, the way to get your face clean is not to break the mirror or do away with the mirror, but to go wash it. When we look into the mirror of God's law, we see that we're sinners. And uh, breaking the law or doing away with the law doesn't take care of that. We go to Jesus for cleansing. So the first one is the law brings us the knowledge of sin. A second use of law that we might notice is found in James, the second chapter, verse 12, where the law is a standard in the judgment. In other words, as God looks at the human race and in the great judgment day, his law will be the standard by which he judges. This is legitimate use of law. Another use of law that the Bible painfully teaches, found in Romans the fourth chapter, verse 15, to condemn sinners, to condemn us. And the law does condemn us. The condemnation of the law is very clear in the Bible. Uh, Mount Sinai, for instance, is a sample of people who felt condemned in the presence of God and his law. And if it wasn't for Mount Sinai, we wouldn't uh, understand the terribleness of sin. But if it wasn't for Mount Calvary, in addition, we'd have nothing but despair. So the two go together. Mount Sinai leads to Mount Calvary. Law and understanding that we are sinners leads us to accept the grace of God. So all of these are good, legitimate functions of law. Another way that Paul talks about it is found in Galatians 3, verse 13, where the law serves to bring us under the curse. The curse, another painful use of law in the Bible. Now, what is the curse of the law? It is hanging on a tree. Jesus took the curse of the law because cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, representing crucifixion. But this is a legitimate use of law, painful as it might be. And then there's another use of law, which is very interesting, found in Galatians, the third chapter, verses 24 and 25. It's a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, a legitimate use of law. 
And Paul uses this argument in his famous book to the Galatians to try and point out that uh, the law really is not for the purpose of making us work harder on being good. We don't look at the law, and the law doesn't have as its function to get us discouraged over trying to change our lives. It is like a schoolmaster or a truant officer getting the pupil to the teacher, in this case the master teacher, who wants to teach us about righteousness through faith. So this is legitimate use of law, schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. I suppose that we could see another all-encompassing purpose of law, to protect us, to protect us. One day I uh, read a scripture that I really doubted for me. It was the psalmist trying to show the beauty of God's law, and he said, Oh, how love I thy law! It is my meditation all the day. <laughs> I couldn't say that that was my situation. I don't know very many young people today in the church or outside the church who say, Oh, how love I law or the laws. They are my meditation all the day. That very day I was driving down the road on a curvy mountain road, and uh, I saw a young fellow pass me on a curve going at a terrific speed. And uh, around the next curve, he drove a little old lady coming up the hill into the ditch. And he continued his reckless course down the mountain. And I was angry. I like to think I was righteously angry. I figured he's going to kill somebody. <clears throat> Down at the bottom of this mountain road, I finally caught up with him. He was stopped by the side of the road, and there was a police officer there with a flashing red light. And I said, oh, how love I the law. It is my meditation all the day. The law served to protect someone like little old ladies driving up the mountain. And it's true. The laws of our land protect us as well as condemn us when we break them. Now there's one use of law that sometimes we confuse and mix up with the others. And this is what causes a real dialogue and debate and some long theological discussions. A wrong use of law is using the law as a method of salvation. This is what the Apostle Paul was dedicated to dealing with. He was painfully aware that there were a lot of religious people around who were trying to use God's law as a method for salvation. In other words, if you can use your backbone and your grit and your determination to uh, be good, to do righteously, then this will save you in heaven. Now, trying to use the law as a method for salvation has a modern word that we attach to it. It's called legalism. Legalism. And uh, I suppose that we could come up with different meanings or definitions for legalism, but most, most Christians have come up with the realization that this is a bad word. This is a dirty word to use on professed Christians or Christians. If you call someone today a legalist, you're really calling him a bad name. And it usually means the kind of person who's trying to work his way to heaven by his good deeds, his good works, his keeping of the law. Well, I would like to expand the meaning of legalist or legalism. There can be more than one type of legalist. Anyone who lives his life apart from the faith relationship with Jesus is a legalist. That is, the one who claims to be a Christian and who hopes to be saved in heaven. Anyone. Now, please don't miss this. Anyone who has no time to spend in personal devotion, communion, fellowship with Jesus day by day, 
Anyone who has no time to pray or read the Bible for himself on his own and who claims to be a Christian and hopes to get to heaven is a legalist. There is no other choice because if you don't believe that you're saved by the faith of God, the grace of God and the faith in that, then you automatically believe that you are going to be saved by your own efforts, your own works. There is no other choice, just the two options. Which means that you could have then uh, two kinds of legalists. And this is almost humorous, the way it has worked out in people's lives. There are people in the Christian church today who have gotten sick and tired of legalism, growing up in a church of, of do's and don'ts, for instance. Sometimes Seventh-day Adventists are charged with this, and maybe rightly so, that they emphasize only the do's and don'ts and end up with a system of legalism. I was talking to a Baptist preacher a while ago. He seemed to be interested in what Adventists teach. And I said, why are you interested in these legalistic Adventists? I was quoting some critics. He said, do you know anything about Southern Baptists? He says, we've been running circles around you on that for years. So this problem of legalism can enter and jump across all denominational barriers. And the surveys have shown that only one out of four, one out of five professed Christians have any time at all for God or faith or devotions, which means that four out of five are legalists, that this is probably the major problem in the church today. But uh, some of these people who are living their lives apart from Christ have reacted against the do's and don'ts and the rules and regulations of the church. And so they call themselves liberals they're no longer legalists because they don't follow the rules and regulations, which leads to another kind of legalism. If a person has reacted against legalism and become liberal, but still has no time for God and is living his life apart from Jesus, he's still a legalist. Only this time, he is finding his security in the rules and regulations that he abandons instead of in the rules and regulations that he keeps. I uh, would suggest that we call the conservative, strict, rigid, law keeper, rule keeping type person the black legalist. And the liberal who has thrown away the rules and regulations, we could call the red legalist. Both of them living their lives apart from God, not experiencing or accepting righteousness through faith in Christ. And the Apostle Paul, whether he was talking to red legalists or black legalists, was unmerciful in his attack on using the law as a method for salvation. In fact, he was so vehement that sometimes he used what some people would call extreme statements, extreme statements, to try and prove his point. And uh, for this reason, he has been criticized by even some of his fellow laborers. Uh, the Apostle Peter says concerning Paul that he said uh, some things, in fact uh, many things, hard to be understood. For which reason people have wrested his uh, teachings to their own destruction. Well, let's try and understand Paul here. He was so vehement against legalism and people trying to save themselves by their own efforts, their own works, that he made statements like this one in Romans 3:28, that we are saved by faith without the deeds of the law. We are saved without the deeds of the law. I can hear people criticizing Paul for that one even today. And then, of course, you have, again, the uh, people in Galatia who had a wonderful experience of the gospel and the Holy Spirit moved on their hearts. And then Paul went on his way and some legalists came along and tried to convince the people that you have to have works as a basis for salvation. And uh, as a result, 
Paul wrote that burning letter to them, calling them idiots. Now, he softened it a little by saying that they were beloved idiots, beloved idiots, but he still called them idiots. Anyone who has found himself in the trap of legalism, trying to be a Christian and trying to live life in such a way that they can earn their way to heaven, make it to heaven by their good deeds, their good works, their obedience, their righteousness, is an idiot according to Scripture. Now the Apostle Paul says in Romans 10, the first few verses, that the uh, people of his day who were so religious had a problem even though he loved them. He said, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. But I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. They were ignorant about something. They were ignorant about righteousness by faith. The only person who experiences righteousness by faith is the one who's given up on his own righteousness and uh, completely stops trying to be a Christian or earn his way to heaven by his good deeds and his good works. So he says they're ignorant. And they haven't submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And then he says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Notice he doesn't say that Christ is the end of the law. That would be quite different. No, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Probably we could paraphrase this. We could say that righteousness by faith is the end of righteousness by works to everyone that believes in it. But the only people who really accept it are the ones who have come to the end of their own resources and submit themselves unto the righteousness of God. Maybe that's why the publicans and harlots went into the kingdom of heaven before the best church members. They came to the end of their own resources. They realized how helpless and weak and sinful they were and were able to accept righteousness by faith. That's why Jesus made a thief his last friend on earth because he felt his need. And it was Jesus who said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Good people have a problem with righteousness by faith. So-called good people are a problem for God. In fact, good people are God's biggest problem, if you please. He's the one that said, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Now, when uh, Paul said that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, he made it clear that Christ is not unfriendly to law. In fact, Jesus is one of the greatest friends of the law. Did you know that he's the one that spoke the law from Mount Sinai? He's the one that we see so active in the Old Testament, really. Follow it through. Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. And he's the one that spoke the world into existence in the first place. When Jesus came, he didn't come to do away with the law. He said so in the Sermon on the Mount. Think not that I am come to destroy the law. Till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or tittle shall pass from the law. Heaven and earth are still here. And apparently God's law is still alive and well. Jesus came to magnify the law and make it honorable we're told. And he did. He did. He said, you people have done it this way, but you ought to do it this way. You ought to have done it 
in such a way so that the law is kept and followed, not simply externally, but from the heart as well. The motives, the purposes, the thoughts, not just external goodness. And then he quoted the psalmist, and the psalmist described Jesus centuries before in the 40th chapter, verse 8. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Did you know that the same sort of experience is available to us? The prophet Jeremiah told us that God's law can be written in our hearts, and God will cause us to walk in his statutes and do his commandments and his judgments. And that's the only way that the law can really be kept from the heart. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was that way with Christ. And did you know that if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we will be but carrying out our own impulses. If we let God refine and sanctify our will, then we'll find our highest delight in doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. God's law is not against us. God's law is for us. Rules are not against us. Rules are for us. How would you like to have a group of young people trying to play a game of basketball and there are no rules? Why, it would ruin the game. It's the rules that make the game go. And the rules of life that God have given are not against us. We can delight in them as Jesus did and consider their friendly purpose but never as a method for salvation. Now, God's grace doesn't do away with his law. In fact, his grace makes his law more meaningful and causes us to want to keep it. Let me tell you about two traffic tickets that I got. This is confession time. One day I was driving along the highway near Madera, California. It was six o'clock in the morning. There was no traffic. The pavement was dry, and I was driving five miles over the speed limit. I didn't realize it, but I was being followed by someone with a red light on top of their car. He stopped me, and was going to give me a ticket. He began writing it out, and I tried to reason with him. I gave him all the reasons why I wasn't driving unsafe, but he didn't listen to me. He was cold and gruff and continued riding the ticket until I got a ticket for five miles over the speed limit. Well, I was unhappy. I like to think I was righteously unhappy, but I probably wasn't. And as he handed me the ticket, I said to him, Now, if you haven't gotten your quota yet for the week, you can continue following me and give me another ticket because I'll be going the same speed. How's that for a jaw sticking out. That was the reaction on me. Then there was the other time I got a traffic stop by a policeman. I was a pastor going to a funeral and I was late. And I had taken a shortcut. I was going across some back roads and the gravel was flying. And a cloud of dust was in the air as I drove. Suddenly there was another cloud of dust in the air behind me. It was a policeman. He pulled me over. He said, what's the matter here? What's wrong? I thought I was following a stolen car. Who are you? And I told him that I was a preacher late to a funeral. He began to fidget, and he kicked his feet back and forth. And he looked down and up and finally said, I don't know what to do with you. He said, uh, if I give you a ticket, your church members will read about it in the paper tomorrow. And I don't think a ticket is the answer anyway. And I said, no, I don't either. <laughs> I was glad to agree with him on that one. 
Suddenly, he paused for a moment and said, okay, go on. You're on your own. Keep going. And he let me go. And I loved that policeman so much because of his grace that I drove the speed limit and I wanted to obey and I wanted to follow the rules more than I ever did. Why? His grace didn't make me break the law more. His grace made me want to keep the law and obey. If you look at it closely, you'll discover that God's grace doesn't do away with obedience. God's grace doesn't do away with the law. The Apostle Paul said it clearly long ago. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. The law is your friend. But for poor sinners, it does condemn us. That's why Jesus is so important. He's the best friend you've ever had. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for the rules of all things. And we'd like to understand better how they make life more meaningful, especially by sending us to the great teacher. Please help us today as we come to you. Teach us the way and bring us the power that you've promised so that we can delight to do thy will, even as Jesus did. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, that's the good news for the planet Earth, where there are four things that God does not know. God does not know a sin he does not hate. God does not know a sinner he does not love. God does not know a sin he won't forgive. And God does not know a better time than now. Thank you.